Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Father, we honor you today. We thank you that we have an opportunity to gain new perspective this morning that we didn't have yesterday. And I pray that that would happen through your word. I pray, God, that you would comfort every single person under the sound of my voice. Give us wisdom. Give us insight. Help us to know how to move forward. Lord, give us strength to be the church you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said, amen. Come on, why don't you make some noise for Jesus one time in this place. You may be seated. Let's have church. You want to have church? Let's have church. Well, welcome to coming to church. Uh, we are so glad that you um, are here. My name is Ryan Leek. I serve on, on our teaching team. Now, I want to say hello to everybody watching in Colleyville, McKinney, Crossroads, those watching online, everybody here in Carrollton. Um, if it's your first time joining us, um, I realize that today could be a little bit different for you. Uh, the vibe might be a little off. You might, you might think, man, why are some people crying one minute, laughing the next minute? It's like, well, what's, some, something's different. Well, uh, just so you know and or you're aware, um, and if you're watching online as well, um, it feels a little bit different because our senior pastor, Ricky Tejada, went to be with Jesus two weeks ago tomorrow. And uh, it's been rough. Uh, it, it sucks, if, if I may say that word, because that's, that's the, the true nature of what it is. Um, it's hard for us as a church. Uh, it's hard for me personally. Um, he was like a father to me. Um, he was more than just a pastor. He was, he was a friend. He was, um, there's not many people in the world that you can call that are a safe space. He was that. You got a lot of people in the world that'll say, I will pray for you. Ricky was, I'm praying right now. And he would start praying for you right then and there. There was no later. We ain't got time for tomorrow. Like he was. He was that person. I got several voicemails that I've, from him just being Pastor Ricky. I'm challenged to leave more voicemails. So you, you might be looking around today. Uh, I might cry. I might laugh. I, I don't know how this is going to go. Um, but it, it, it's because, it, and if you're trying to get a good read on us as a church, you're like, listen, we're a fun bunch, I promise you. Um, we're just riding the waves. So, you, so if you're sitting next to somebody and they just start crying, pardon the interruption, okay? It's just, we're just in that, in that season. We're mourning the loss of one of the greatest men we've ever known. And we're also full of joy thinking about the legacy that he, he left. I mean, if you missed his memorial service, I mean, it was just four hours of laughing and crying back and forth for every five minutes. And it was, it was awesome. And, and so let's, let's, just, let's just put everything on the table for just a minute, because when, when we first found out that Pastor Ricky contracted COVID-19, uh, we immediately started praying and fasting. We prayed every prayer that there is. We got every healing scripture. I was at the hospital doing a Jericho drive, okay? I was driving around the hospital seven times until the police came and said there's suspicious activity in the parking lot. And I said, I'm not going to jail over this, okay? I'm going to pray for my house right now, okay? Because things are getting a little dicey. I mean, we did everything in our power. I mean, everything we know to do. At one point, I lost human words. I just spoke in tongues for a whole week, okay? I was like, I didn't know what else to say. And we didn't get the outcome we were hoping for. And ironically, Pastor Ricky had laid out um, the teaching series for, for the whole fall. And so uh, before he passed, I'm supposed to start a series today on prayer. And I'm like, really? <laughs> today, of all days, I'm supposed to talk about prayer? 
the, the, the series we're starting today is called Empowered. When you pray, things change. To which I'm going to God, you want me to tell that to a bunch of people who are wondering if prayer works at all? What in the world? Are, and, I, and perhaps the thing that changes when we pray isn't always the thing. Sometimes the thing that changes is us. And so I want to humbly submit to you a message I've entitled, How to Pray When You're Disappointed and Brokenhearted. How to Pray When You're Disappointed and Brokenhearted. And I have to tell you, I've been pretty disappointed and brokenhearted over the past few weeks. My faith has been tested. I don't know about you, but well, actually I do know about you. You have sang the song, you know, and if you never did another thing, I still have reason enough to sing thank you. You ever prayed the prayer, God, if you never did another thing for me, we're good. Until you pray for something you really want and don't get it. And then you're like, come on, God. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Remember that song? You had it on repeat. That's the journey of faith. Sometimes you're like, yeah, 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 I'm good. And then all of a sudden, something happens. It would be nice if the way that prayer worked was A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Like if you just throw in, in the name of Jesus at the end of everything, it would just happen, right? That'd be great. Except that's not how it often happens. And what I came to encourage each and every person here with today is that it, whether you were praying for Pastor Ricky or you're here for the first time and you don't even know who he is, but yet you have had a moment in your life where you have had a broken heart or disappointment or God didn't answer something that you thought he should have. What you need to know is that whenever you're going through anything, you should ask the question, is there anybody in the Bible that went through something similar? Do I have biblical company or am I alone on this planet? And what has often encouraged me in the darkest times of my life is I find out what God said to somebody in the dark in here, maybe he would say it to us. And so I want to look at two core passages today that I think are going to encourage us, and we're going to find out that there are groups of people who are in our same boat. The first ones are found in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Verse 2 says, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. And this was a period in time where the church was just picking up steam, was just picking up momentum. And part of the credibility of the first century church was that there were eyewitnesses to people that saw not only Jesus die and, and get resurrected, but also saw the miracles themselves of Jesus. And so James was a pillar of the early church, no doubt. And so what the, what the Roman government wanted to do is say, hey, we, if we can make a spectacle of these Jesus followers, maybe we could stop this movement. And so for James, when people would say Jesus Christ is the son of the living God and you should give your life to him and follow after the way, he could say, by the way, this whole 5,000 feeding story, I was there. I was an usher that day, okay? I passed out baskets, okay? I picked up leftovers. I was there. I saw it with my own two eyes. Herod said, kill him. Killed him by the sword, beheaded it's over. You just lost a pillar in the first century church. And where we are in the text, the church has just lost James. They just lost them. You don't think they prayed for James? You don't think they prayed hard for James? And then the next verse in verse 5 makes absolutely no sense to me. It makes no sense to me because verse 5 says this. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Earnestly praying to God for him. How hard must it have been to pray for Peter when they just lost James? Not kumbaya, earnestly praying for Peter. 
Not, Lord, if you got time, I mean, if you stop by, help him, get, help him get out of prison. I don't know. We just lost James. On the very cusp of disappointment, how do you find strength to pray earnestly for something new when you're disappointed and brokenhearted by something old? I can't speak for you, but I can speak for me that, man, I heard we was doing 21 days of prayer. I said, we just did 21 days of prayer. Are we sure? I mean, I'm like, I'm tired. I'm hungry. Been fasting, tried to work out, fasted for Pastor Ricky, almost passed out at the gym. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this no more. Sometimes you can get a little weary. And some of us grew up in church environments where you weren't allowed to question God or his word. But my primary issue with that type of theology is we all experience something in life that makes us question God. We just don't always question it out loud. And so we think because we didn't question it out loud, I didn't question it. God can see what's in your head. What you talking about? So whether you questioned it with your friends, it's, it's still there. The question remains. And so there are moments in our life where we are asking the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And perhaps you can get to a place where you can reconcile that a little bit. But where we really have to call a time out with God is not when bad things happen to good people, but when bad things happen to godly people. Because we're going, whoa, 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 whoa. Him? I mean, I, I can see how that could happen to, to the drug dealer, to the terrorist. Pastor? Good pastor? What? I wonder how many people are here today, watching today, from one of our locations, and this has been your hurdle. This has been your God hurdle. This has been the thing that you go, you know what? The reason I'm not a fully surrendered follower of Jesus, the reason that I've not gone all in, perhaps you say the reason I'm not a Christian at all, it's because I had way too many questions that I wasn't even allowed to ask, and I didn't get any answers, and so you know what? I'm out. But I want to encourage us this weekend. The same God we question is the same God we can lean on. The same God we question is the same God we can lean on. In other words, you can be mad at God and go to God at the same time. God is not intimidated by your anger or your question. He is big enough to handle it. And we're not the first one to ask these questions. The interesting thing about pain is it always feels unique. It always feels like, it's just me. I'm all alone. We're not. We're not the first ones to go through something like this. And we're not the last. We're not the first people to suffer, lose something significant, lose someone significant and wonder where in the heavens is the good God we all sing about when we need him the most. How in the world do you pray for Peter when you just lost James? Earnestly. Where do you find that type of strength? I think one of the people who found themselves in a similar place as a man found in the gospel narrative of Jesus. His name is John the Baptist. There's a couple things you need to know about John the Baptist. The first one is found in Luke 7, verse 28. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. He says, I tell you, among those born of women, which is everybody, just in case you're wondering, <laughs> there is no one greater than John. Right away, Jesus says, hey, let me tell you something about John. He's the goat. If you don't know what goat means, it means greatest of all time, okay? Like, that's what that means, okay? Goat. Jesus is going, hey, uh, let me tell you something about John. This is a great man, the greatest, I might add. This is not Sports Illustrated, okay? This is not a reporter with an opinion. This is Jesus, the Alpha, the Omega. The name above all names is saying, among those born of women, which is everyone including Michael Jordan and LeBron James. He's like, let me settle the debate for you. It's John. John the Baptist. 
So, so what you need to know is this is somebody that Jesus thinks very highly of. The second thing you need to know about John the Baptist is John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. They family. I'm not talking about like, you know, you got that homie that you grew up with, y'all super close, and you call each other cousins, but you're not really cousins at all. Like, like, like oh, that's my cousin. No, you're my neighbor, okay? Like, 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 let's keep it real. They're actually family. That, that's who we're talking about. And there comes a point in John's life where he is arrested for preaching about his cousin. So John started gaining a following and the government didn't see, oh, this is a nice social media influencer. No, 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 no. They said, this is a threat. And then scripture gives us Jesus' Jesus's response here. It says, he finds out that John's in prison and Matthew 4 verse 12 says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew. I don't like that word. He withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth. He went and lived in Capernaum. You may have never used the maps in the back of your Bible. Today, we're going to use it because it illustrates the point. I want you to see what this looks like for Jesus and for John. So John is in prison in a desert in a place called Machaerus. You see that down there on the red dot. Jesus is in Nazareth, and the scripture says when he heard about John, he went that way. Hey, Jesus, I, think, I don't think you heard what we said. We said John's in prison. And Jesus withdrew and started going the opposite direction of where John is. Um, uh, me and some young adults got to go. Uh, to Israel. I'm going to show you where Jesus went, okay? I want you to see this picture of where Jesus went. Jesus went to the beach. <laughs> Am I talking to any real Christians today? <laughs> Who has ever prayed a prayer and you thought, hey God, where are you? And it feels like you're going in the opposite direction of me. Have you ever had a need you felt like God could clearly see but was going in a different direction? I can't think of anybody who embodies this more than John the Baptist. And the story doesn't get better for John. The Gospel of Luke tells us while John was in prison, Luke 7 verse 13, John's disciples told him about all these things. So, so th there is this thing that he's going, hey, dear John, we, we got some news to report to you. For us to know what these things are, we have to go back to the top of Luke chapter 7 to see what it is that John heard in prison. This is what he heard. Luke 7 verse 1, when Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion servant whom his master valued highly was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to ask him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this. Deserves. Because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. What? Are you serious? Wait till you see the next one. Verse 12, as he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry, and heals the boy, raises him from the dead. Jesus is going with the guy who the elders believe deserve a healing because he helped build the synagogue, gave a little bit more in the offering, deserves. Have you ever read something in scripture that made you want to cuss? Deserves. Deserves. Any word but that one. Deserves. You mean to tell me Pastor Ricky didn't 
deserve? Deserve. Like that's the word. So this is what John the Baptist is hearing in prison. And that, hey, uh, John, just so you know, there's a guy that deserves it. Oh, and, and oh, John, guess what? Um, there's this lady, Jesus don't even know her, but his heart's breaking for her. These are the things he is hearing in prison. Hey, Jesus, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know this is your cousin, right? No disrespect. You know he baptized you. Your heart don't break for John? You don't think John deserves to be broken out of jail? There's something in us that likes to play God. We love to play the deserve game. This person deserves it. This one doesn't. And when you read your Bible a lot and you pray a lot and you give to the church and you serve at the church and you have integrity and you do your best to live life according to scripture, when things get tough, don't we all think we deserve something from God? Like God owes us. Look at us. I mean, if you're John, it's embarrassing. Hey, Jesus. I'm in jail for telling people you're the savior of the world and you can't even save your cousin? Are you serious? If you're one of John's disciples and you're coming back to prison, don't shoot the messenger, John. Hey, uh, let me tell you what Jesus is doing for everybody else but you. Do you feel the tension in the prison? Could you feel the tension of someone walking through a church trying to figure out if God answers prayers at all? Especially when you think, hey, I might not deserve it, but he did. He did. John's disciples told him all about these things, calling two of them, it got real. He sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect somebody else? I mean, help me out. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure. I mean, are you the one could be translated? I didn't think my story would end this way. Wouldn't you and I be sitting in the prison asking the same question? Going, this is, <laughs> this is my reward? This is, this, is what, this is what I get for telling people about Jesus. I mean, I love what Jesus says next. In verse 23, he says, Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone that does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone that does not allow their situations to make them lose their faith. Blessed is anyone that has figured out a way to say, you know, I'm not going to allow my, my circumstances to determine what I believe about God. Because it's easy to be sitting in a prison and be comparing our life to somebody else's. It's easy to be comparing our worst circumstances to the blessings God's doing for everybody else. Have you ever pretended to be happy for somebody? You know, like when uh, you are praying for the one and your friend who doesn't pray at all gets engaged to a doctor. <laughs> so happy for you. Thank God for that. Praise God. You didn't even pray? Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> Encouraging. It's great. You ever try to trick God into giving you what he want, giving you what you want? Trying to make God believe that your will is his? You be throwing scriptures out for no reason. 
Lord, you said it's not good for a man to be alone. I see a single man right over there who's alone. I'm going to answer the prayer. God, I pray that I would be blessed to be a blessing to somebody else. If he could be 6'3", your will, Lord, whatever you say. (laughs) It's interesting, right? When we go to God with our stuff, hoping it's his. It's weird when you <laughs> lose a job and your friend gets a promotion. You owe money on your taxes. Your friend got a refund because they got five kids. You're like, he don't even work. How did he? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know Antoine. You know him, Lord. I don't get it. Help me. I've been here faithful, tithing. Like, what's going on? You praying for your business not to go under. Your friend talking about some God gave them a parking spot at the mall. You're like, what kind of God do we serve? This just just can be a little confusing at times, right? It It can be hard to find the energy for other people when you just lost James. It can be hard to find energy. It can be hard to find perspective when you're sitting in a prison hearing about what God is doing for everybody else. When you hear that someone else recovered from COVID, you're like, I, I, act, I am happy for you. I am. It's just a little hard. Can I tell you something about the journey of faith for every single Christian? One of the biggest hurdles any Christian will have is dealing with unanswered prayer. That is a sometimes what some would call a crisis of faith where you're going, I did everything I could. Nothing. I know way too many people who have walked away from God altogether because of one unanswered prayer. God didn't heal their mom and they decided that God wasn't a God worth serving that would let his mom die. What do you do? When you've been praying for a wayward child to come back home and they haven't, what do you do with an unanswered prayer for a mental health challenge? You've tried everything. You've seen many doctors and nothing. What do you do with an unanswered prayer for a pastor who's fighting COVID-19? What would Jesus say to someone with unanswered prayer? I think he'd say, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. At one point, later in Luke, it tells us that Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, evil spirits, gave sight to many who were blind. So when John's disciples came to Jesus and said, are you the one? He told them to go back to John and tell them what they saw and heard. That the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. He's going, hey, tell John we're still in business. Tell John the kingdom is still advancing. Tell John his work wasn't for nothing. He paved the way, and tell John he played his part. You know, what's interesting is um, for those of you that didn't get to know uh, Pastor Ricky um, that well, he would often stand on this stage or stand at the altar and he would pray for souls. He would pray that people would come to know Jesus. And he would literally prophesy and call souls from the north, the south, the west, and the east. Okay, he, he would literally stand up here and do that. And he would have this thing with the staff where he'd say, I'm believing for 100 souls Sunday. 100 souls, 100 souls. I'd be like, yeah, 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 you know, we're praying for, for 100 souls. And so um, August 8th, I was preaching. And he said, 100 souls, Ryan, 100 souls. I said, Pastor Ricky, I'm preaching on adultery. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I got faith, but I don't know. I mean, that's a hard right at the end. Stop cheating and give your life to Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it can work, but a hundred? I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to do my best. No pressure, 
right? <laughs> Needless to say, we didn't hit a hundred on the eighth, but nevertheless, <laughs> this past weekend, 226. I get new perspective every single day. Don't try to make theological conclusions in the middle of your pain. Because the chef is still cooking. We're still in business. And it's, it's amazing to me. You know what Pastor Ricky used to say to me all the time? Um, anytime I was worried about something, he'd say, boy, you got seed in, you got seed in the ground. Like, you're right. I do got some seed in the ground. You talk about a family that's got seed in the ground? It's the Todd's. And, and here's what's so amazing, Pastor said, is, is God is still answering the prayers of your husband. And he will continue to answer those prayers long after he's gone. And the, the kingdom continues to advance. And so the world might define someone that is blessed or wealthy as someone that has been able to keep all of their money. Jesus is going, you want to find somebody who's really blessed? Somebody that's been through hell and kept their faith. That's a blessed person. Blessed is anyone that does not allow their circumstances to change how they see God. And I know it's hard not to lose your faith when you're faced with hardship but don't walk away because of one unanswered prayer. But there is a category of Christians who can be in pain and not be okay. That's not anti-Christian. You can pray and be in pain at the exact same time. Those aren't mutually exclusive. Like you can do that. And I want you to know it's okay to not be okay. Let's just make sure we run towards God, not away. Away from God. In the hospital room, God bless Baylor Scott and White and Grapevine. They were not ready for the Covenant Church staff. Let me tell you that right now, okay? <laughs> they were not ready for Pastor Sid Tejada, okay? Let me tell you something. I have never seen anything like it. It wasn't just a pastor's wife. This was an army general, okay? I've never seen strength like what I saw. And you know, when you walk into a hospital, you, you walk slow, okay? You, you just, you're, just trying to, you're trying to just read the room a little bit, and they're trying to kick people out. And see, it's like, you ain't kicking nobody. I'm like, I, I'm with her. I don't know if I'm with her. I'm, try, I'm trying to figure it out. I'm just here to pray. I, I'm scared. I don't know. I got a mask on. I'm just trying to like, nobody can see my face. And so we're just kind of walking around. She's got worship music playing. And then, like, we have dominated the waiting room at this point, right? Like, Cove has just taken over the waiting room. I'm like, I like it, okay? I like the energy here. But then um, strangers started showing up to see their loved ones. And if you're not a Christian and you walk into a Holy Ghost meeting in the waiting room, you're like, is this the right room? No, you in the right room, okay? And let, let me tell you what blessed me is with tears in her eyes, I saw Pastor Sid turn down the music and pray for somebody else. <laughs> and like I said, she was an army general. It wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna turn down the music and I'm gonna pray for them. It was like, all of y'all, Ryan, come over here, come on, pray for Jacob. Who's Jacob? I don't know, oh yeah, okay, I'm coming. <laughs> Jacob, yeah, we're going to pray for Jacob. Yeah, look, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm just here. We're here to pray for anybody and everybody. How do you pray when you're brokenhearted and disappointed? You put one foot in front of another, and you just keep praying. Can I tell you who my heroes are in life? Parents who've lost their children and have figured out a way to get out of bed and can walk through the doors of a church and lift their hands in worship. At one point during the memorial service, I just saw Sid standing. 
hands lifted high. There are some things we just give to God. I, I marvel at people who have lost something or someone and they have not lost their faith. There's a verse that breaks my heart in John's story. Luke 7, verse 24 says, After John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. Ah! Oh! <sighs> this is where he says, he's speaking to the crowd. This is where he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Wouldn't that have been great for John to hear? Hey, I know things didn't work out how you thought it would, but just so you know, Jesus thinks you're the GOAT. Thanks for holding on to the fact they didn't get that part. All they got was these things. Here's what God is doing for everybody else but you. And oh, by the way, thank you for your service. The kingdom is still advancing. Then Jesus said, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Wait, what? Jesus, you just said he was the goat. Yeah, he is. On earth. But let's not get it twisted, ladies and gentlemen. I, 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 this is a heaven thing. You know that, right? There's a lot of things that we don't know, but here's what we do. Is that John's prison had a purpose that he and Jesus would only see on the other side of eternity but Jesus didn't let the pain of a prison keep him from having a kingdom perspective as great as John was how did the church in Acts 12 continue to earnestly pray for Peter after just losing James I think they had a kingdom perspective I think they had this mindset that says we still got work to do and it'd be great if we had Peter. I don't know why we lost James. But I'm not going to stop praying. I remember my, my father suffered from a stroke years back before he passed. And he was on hospice for about two years. And he had a bed sore about the size of a football in his back. I'll be honest, I, never, I could never look at it. My mom just described it to me. A few years after he passed, I was preaching somewhere and, and a friend came to me and they said, man, your dad has to be on the banister of heaven, looking down and he's so proud of you. I said, maybe. I don't know. I can tell you, if I went to heaven, I'm not looking back down to see what you're doing. <laughs> no offense, but I'm, I got <laughs> gold streets. I'm, you think I'm going to look at your highway? I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> Maybe dad's watching online right now. Maybe he's dancing on streets of gold. I don't know, but this I do know. He's not thinking about that one. His perspective has changed because of where he is. You know who has a perspective on our church that none of us have right now? Pastor Rick. I'd love to, I'd love to be the heaven guru and tell you what we're going to be doing and what it's like, but this, this, is, this, this is what I know for sure. Okay, This is what I can tell you for sure. We're probably going to spend at least a decade doing this. Oh, I see. God, you good, boy. You good. I knew you see. I, I couldn't see that on the earth. But now that I'm here and I got your position, you know what? That, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, okay. I see it. Yep. Oh, 
That's why she broke up with me. I, I see it now. I couldn't see it then. I was heartbroken. I was mad at you. I cursed at you. God, I'm so sorry about that. It's just going to be a lot of us for a while. We're going to be in awe of God, but we're going to be in awe of his perspective. We're going to just go, oh, that's why I served there. That's why I worked there. That's why I went to that school. That's why that happened to this person. And you could see things that I could not see. And so in light of what we will see then, I have to join our pastor in just worshiping. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And here's the deal. That doesn't change the fact that I miss my dad or miss our pastor. And that if I could write the script of his life, if I could write the script of their life, it'd be different. If we could change the circumstances, we would. Isn't it interesting? that our beliefs in God change based off of what God has kind of done for us lately. Like somehow God becomes different when things are bad and God becomes different when things are good. But here's what I, here, here's what I wanna close with. You need to know how Jesus feels about us. I love the, the last verse I wanna share with you is Matthew 14, 13. It says, when Jesus heard what had happened, that John was beheaded. Scripture says he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Even Jesus is gone. I need a minute. John? God, really, John? Not John! But even Jesus had to surrender to God's will for John. And Jesus had to, sur to surrender to God's will for him. Because if you and I could write the script for John, we would say, Jesus, you got to save the world. You picking teams? Why don't we drop Judas off in the Mediterranean Sea and pick up John the Baptist on the way and grab him up out of prison and let's go save everybody. Because if you and I could could write scripture for our life, nobody would ever die. Everyone would be healthy, everyone would be rich, free education, world peace, and everyone would all get along. You know what we want? Heaven. On earth, and there's a little bit of you and a little bit of me that's just going, God, can't you just save everybody? He's going, I did. And I made that option available to everybody. And so if you're wondering how God feels about you right now, if you're wondering how God feels about your pain, don't look at your circumstance to determine how God feels about you. God's proof of his love towards us is not our preferred outcomes, incomes, or circumstances. God's proof of his love towards us is giving his one and only son to die for us. That's the proof. That's the proof, so where do we go from here, Covenant Church? What do, what, do, what do we do now? We become an Acts 12 type of church, and we keep praying, we keep believing, we keep singing, we keep worshiping, we keep casting out devils, we keep praying for miracles, we still believe that God is who we said he is. We keep standing in faith. We keep joining hands with people. We keep attacking depression. We keep attacking anxiety. And we believe God is who he says he is. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for this church. God, I pray that we would find strength in you to keep praying, to have a kingdom perspective. Lord, would you give us enough strength to look past what breaks our heart long enough to see what you're up to? And may we play our part in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, join us as we sing.
might be here today and you may have had your own share of pain and disappointment and I want to give each and every person an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of their life with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today and you say, I need to make Jesus the Lord of my life, I've had some things in my life that have steered me away from God, but I believe that today is the day for me to surrender my life to Jesus. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, Ryan, that's me. Ryan, that's me. I see a couple hands back there. That's awesome. Anybody else? I see your hand, ma'am. I see your hand. That's awesome. Anybody else? A couple hands in the balcony. That's great. I'm sure there's hands online as well. Hey, can we all say this prayer together? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I surrender my future, my life to you. Your blood gives me a fresh start. And I will live the rest of my days for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it. Amen. Come on, can we make some noise for every single person that gave their heart to Christ? Best decision you've ever made. Hey, if you made that decision today, uh, there's something we want to put in your hands. It's just next steps. It just helps you figure out what, what to do next now that you've made Jesus the Lord of your life. We've got a prayer team down here that would love to pray for you and give you that booklet. Um, you can also text the phrase, I am saved, to the number 41411. Again, that's I am saved to the number 41411. And we will actually text you a digital download for you to get started. And once again, you made the best decision you have ever made. Come on, can we make some noise for each and every person once again? Amazing. Amazing. 100 Soul Sunday. I think today was the day. I think today was the day. I believe that. I believe that. Hey, uh, join us next week as we continue this series on prayer. Can I bless you before we go? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And may he cover you with his name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have a great week.